you everyone for choosing to share this evening with uh, me here in this beautiful hall. And um, at the beginning, I would like to thank um, my host, the whole you, which is a beautiful name, which is a bit of a play on words, um, I realized, and also uh, Seattle Dharma Friendship Foundation for really uh, giving me this opportunity to have a chance to meet with the members of the local community. Um, I remember Seattle quite well. Um, I've been here several times with His Holiness as his interpreter. And the last time I was here was in 2008 uh, for a series of very, very beautiful, but also quite culturally seminal historic yeah, meetings known as the Seeds of Compassion. Um, I particularly remember the beautiful moving public event out in the open. You know, we had um, you know, some uh, uh, you know, aeroplane flying around as well. Uh, it was a really beautiful uh, event, very, very memorable. And um, since then, Seattle has come to associate in my mind with uh, what I truly value, which is compassion. And also, I was very happy to find out that Seattle turned out to be the first city to sign on the Charter of Compassion, which Karen Armstrong, you know, initiated. Uh, Karen, those who don't know Karen, uh, she is a very famous British author, a former Catholic nun, just as I'm a former Tibetan monk. <laughs> um, and Karen um, won the TED um, Award, and the, the dream gift that the TED um, gave her was to create this Charter of Compassion. And, uh, and I was very happy to know Seattle was the first city to sign on. And now I think there are probably around 200 cities from all over the world that are part of that Compassionate Cities movement. So I think here uh, in Seattle, there is something, I don't know what, maybe it's the presence of Boeing here, which connects the whole world together. <laughs> <laughs> or Microsoft which connects the whole world in a different way, <laughs> or Starbucks. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, whatever it is, uh, Starbucks is the company that makes drinking coffee cool, you know? <laughs> I have two teenage daughters, so I know what Starbucks is. <laughs> and, um, and I often argue with them. I said, why do you pay? $3 or $4 for a cup of coffee from Starbucks when you can walk to the other, street, other side of the street and get for a dollar from McDonald's. <laughs> they says, Daddy, you don't know a thing. <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, so um, I, I'm really happy to be here once again. Now, this time in my own personal capacity. Um, you know, and much of my public life really has been um, being the kind of, you know, voice and medium for His Holiness. And uh, I also see that as perhaps my uh, greatest act of service, um, to be able to serve His Holiness as his principal translator for so many years. This October, it's going to be 30 years, has been the greatest privilege in my life because I know that in my own humble capacity, I will never, even in my dream, will have the opportunity to have ability to connect with millions of people out there. But simply having that opportunity to serve him also offers me the opportunity to serve a much larger group of people. So um, it's been a real privilege. And one of the things um, I've always wanted to do, you know, ever since I began serving him, was to really try to see one of these days, maybe I could do something, you know, <coughs> in the form of bringing a kind of a much sharper focus on his message of compassion. Um, he has traveled extensively all around the world um, for more than four decades now. He began traveling internationally in <coughs> 1973. Um, and, you know, in addition to the message of peace, the other powerful message that he brings across the world is the message of compassion. And His Holiness has been a strong advocate of compassion for a long, long time. And he's probably one of the very, very early, you know, um, kind of, you know, campaigners and pro promoters of compassion, if not the first one, 
who insist on making the point that compassion may have been historically promoted by religious institutions as part of religious values, but in itself, it is independent of religion. And the compassion and the fundamental values like forgiveness, tolerance, acceptance, and so on, are really much you know, best understood as values that are inherent to basic human condition and sentiments that are part of our human existence rather than something that we have acquired through socialization, acculturization, or through religious uh, teaching. And, and he, one of the things that he has really de dedicated his life is to really promote this idea that we could develop a robust discourse on understanding these fundamental values in a way that, is, that speaks directly to human experience, that does not require being tied to any particular you know, framework of a culture or religion or, or you know, kind of a philosophy. And, and he has been trying, you know, he has worked very hard to really promote this idea that some, and also to make the point that in fact, if you look at many you know, ethical teachings of all the great religions, you know, when it comes to actual prescription on what is a good life to lead, there is a striking convergence among all these great religious traditions. And also, and if you look at what is the foundation that underpins you know, all of these great ethical teachings of the world religions, we will recognize it is, found, it is compassion. You know, it may be you know, presented and the language used may be slightly different. In some languages, it will come up as a love, charity, or whatever, maybe compassion. So, but the point is, compassion is what underpins the ethical teachings of all the great religions. And his point is that that must speak something very profoundly about the reality of compassion in our shared human experience. And I think this, you know, I have always felt that this is a message that is so important and that really needs to be driven home and brought to the larger world. And particularly in today's age, um, when we are increasingly living in a small world. You know, we are, you know, it is sort of a cliche to say, you know, we are, you know, the world is getting smaller and we are in a globalized world. It's a sort of a cliche, everybody knows. But what people, you know, don't pay enough attention to is what would that mean in terms of our thinking about the world, in terms of our perception about people from other backgrounds, other religion, other cultures, and how our, what kind of skills that we may have to emphasize that allow us and the future generation to be live in such a pluralistic world where the plural, plurality are all coming together. And uh, in one of his Holiness's books, he has made the point that one of the greatest challenges of the 21st century is going to be peaceful coexistence. Because cultures, languages, ideologies, and religions are going to increasingly come together. And we will have to equip and the younger generation particularly and learn ourselves a way of being in a world that takes that reality into account. And here too, you know, taking more seriously our fundamental nature of compassionate instinct is going to be the key. So, um, and in my own personal life, um, having grown up as um, you know, a Tibetan refugee child in India. Um, my parents left um, in the middle of 1959, soon after, uh, towards the end of 1959, soon after His Holiness the Dalai Lama escaped to India. And uh, I, although I was born in Tibet towards the end of 58, I have no memory of Tibet. Um, I was put in a boarding school like many Tibetans of my age because the parents have to work and the only work that they could do without speaking the language of, of country, India, was to do manual work. And uh, the most available work that the many Tibetans found was the construction of road, uh, which because all of a sudden now India had you know, thousands of kilometers between Tibet and India, they needed to be guarded militarily, which meant you have to build 
militarily motorizable road going all the way up to the border. And it's all high altitude road building. And my parents, like many of the Tibetans of, of their generation, uh, ended up working on these road constructions, which meant that young children could, work, could not be dragged along with them. Uh, and uh, we were put in boarding schools. So I went to the boarding age, the school at the age of four and a half. And uh, you know, very soon, once I started becoming more kind of you know uh, aware, and uh, you know, as you grow older, you you do, you come to know more. I realized that actually, you know, we were living on the charity of other people. The school that I was going to was funded by Save the Children's Fund, uh, which is a British charity. Uh, again, contributions from thousands of ordinary people, um, and. You know the clothes that we were wearing, and all of this. Uh, so the, the the compassion of other people had played a very real role in my growing up, um, and also uh, in you know having been brought up in traditional Tibetan Buddhist culture, uh, compassion was also very very uh, um, kind of you know central to everyday consciousness uh, of our spiritual experience. Um, you know. Those who have been to Tibet and Tibetan cultural area will know that a lot of Tibetans go around the temple, they turn this prayer wheel, and that prayer wheel is packed with thousands of, hundreds of thousands of sim small prints of this man in a mantra, Omani Padme Hum, which is a mantra of compassion. And the idea is when you turn it around, every time you turn it around, because there are so many multiple repetitions of the mantra, and you get the equal karma of repeating that many times. <laughs> so that's the idea. Um, and then, of course, you know, the most important visible cultural icon that Tibetan children grow up being aware of all the time is the figure of His Holiness the Dalai Lama. You know, his presence is very real in the consciousness of Tibetan people, even children. And he is the personification of compassion. So compassion as a value was very dominant in our you know, thinking. In my own personal life, it was very real. But when I finished my monastic university studies, I, went, I had the opportunity to go to Cambridge. And by that time, I had already started to interpret for His Holiness. I began my service for him in 85, more of a coincidence, um, accidentally. Then in 89, I had the opportunity to go and study at Cambridge. So I chose to do philosophy, which is a, in Cambridge is one of those places where you can just do pure philosophy for three years. But one thing that really struck me uh, was how unwilling many educated people were to really recognize that they are truly selfless, compassionate acts. You know, there was a, you know, quite a, you know, quite a widespread belief that behind every human action, the ultimate reason has to be somehow related to some kind of self-benefit and self-interest. And uh, so I, this really intrigued me. And then I started digging deeper. I became, you know, exposed to the Darwin and evolutionary theory and how this survival of the fittest uh, is a very, very important kind of, I would call it ideology, actually. Um, and how, you know, pursuit of self-interest is, is recognized as the fundamental drive which manifests in, in competition. And competition and pursuit of self-interest are the two drivers that shape human evolution as well as human behavior. And that was the standard official theory. And that was basically the story of who we were as species. And, and in a way, you know, people have fancy words for these kind of concepts. They call it concept of theory of human nature. But in the end, when we are talking about theory of human nature, we're talking about the story we tell about ourselves. It's essentially a story that we tell about who we are. And the, the official story that we were telling about our, who we are basically says that we are self-serving creatures you know, who manifest this impulse through competitiveness and survival of the fittest. And uh, so, and in fact, there is a, a, a very, very um, famous saying, you know, actually quite a notorious saying by an American biologist who said, uh, scratch an altruist and watch a hypocrite bleed. 
I mean, that sort of captures the idea that, you know, it was so powerful, this idea. And in fact, our whole economic system is really built on this idea that we are profit maximizers. We, you know, in any given situation, we will make a rational choice where we will make the decision where we have the most amount of gain. And this, this was the classic economic theories model of who we are as economic agents. You know, the whole system was built. Now, in this kind of picture of who we are as human beings, then you have a real problem dealing with our impulses like kindness, our impulses like altruistic behavior or compassion. So what do we do? Okay, we either relegate them into the religious domain, Okay, say so that these are religious values, and if you're religious, it's wonderful. You get inspired, but these are religious values, and if you're not religious, you know, they, they, they don't matter to me. So that's one way of relegating it. The other way of relegating it is to put it in an informal you know, domain where we expect these kind of impulses to be expressed in a small area, like our family context. A parent is expected to be kind to their children, Children are expected to be kind to each other. So we, we relegate into an informal area, but when it comes to the larger society, we don't really expect that kind of impulses to have a key role to play. Now, where we do bring that element in, then we bring it in as a kind of a restraint to what is otherwise this beastly human instinct which is a pursuit of self-interest and survival of the fittest. And so these values like compassion and altruism and kindness become part of a restraining factor that we need to bring in so that we rein in these kind of other impulses that might otherwise lead to all sorts of you know, stuff. And that was, for me, quite an intriguing experience. I remember having, and I tell that story in my book, I remember having he did arguments with my you know, fellow Cambridge students, saying that this is a weird idea, actually. You know? and, and, you know, and, and people who are brought up in this culture, they don't realize how weird this idea is. <laughs> you know, because you, you take it for granted. You know, it's part of the official story. But for someone coming from outside, this is a really weird idea. And then when, when I would cite the example of someone like Mother Teresa, and the Cambridge students are very smart. You know, it's, it's, it's not easy to get into Cambridge. In fact, they are so smart, there's this thing called uh, the fifth week, fifth week syndrome, which is because when Cambridge undergraduates first come in, they are coming from many different places, schools where they were used to being the brightest and the best and the special. They all come together in Cambridge, and by the fifth week, they're depressed <laughs> because they realize they're an average. <laughs> Every, everybody else is like them. So, so anyway, the Cambridge students are very smart. So when I would cite example of someone like Mother Teresa, they would argue back saying, well, even in the case of Mother Teresa, there must be something in it for her. Otherwise, why would be she doing it? And so these kind of you know, arguments uh, are quite interesting. So, and that was one of the things that really disturbed me a little. And I sort of started thinking about, you know, how can we bring compassion into a kind of a, into a discourse where we can somehow rise above this, this, this you know, very powerful ideology of, you know, that sees human nature, you know, primarily in terms of this pursuit of self-interest and competition. And uh, so that was one interesting sort of uh, uh, idea behind in my mind. But one of the very exciting thing about our time now is that official story is now being challenged. Um, to some extent, probably as a result of different ideas coming together, you know, those who are familiar will know that increasingly group of scientists and Buddhist scholars engage in ongoing conversations, you know, really kind of challenging each other's assumptions and exploring ways in which the two investigative traditions can come together and develop 
techniques and practices that could be beneficial to the world. Mindfulness is now very widespread, but mindfulness is one of those products that came out of that interface of Buddhist ideas and insights and practices on the one side and rigors of science and clinical applications on the other. So, um, so that might be one, one important cultural factor. But the most important influence that has really led to this kind of rethinking of human nature really has come from uh, the non-human primate studies. Non-human primate studies have demonstrated that some rudimentary form of empathy is even found in animals, in the, in the apes. Um, some of you might have seen this image of uh, two young chimps you know, fighting juveniles and one of them loses badly and another one comes over and, and gives him a hug and consoles him. Now, consolation is a very sophisticated emotion. You know, you have to first understand the situation, you have to empathize with it, and then you have to respond to that, the need of that person, you know, that, that, you know, chimp that has just lost. So these kind of research are pointing up uh, kind of important questions that if impulses like these are found in animals, then why not in human beings as a natural impulses? And then a lot of work has really come from a child developmental psychologist uh, where they tried to discern how far into early childhood that we can see instinctive, you know, natural helping behavior on the part of the children. Um, there is a wonderful a series of experiments done by two German scientists uh, from Max Planck Institute. Um, if you get a chance, um, watch them on, on, you know, on, the, on the net. Actually, the experiments are very clever. You know, one of them involves um, a grown up uh, you know, putting clothes, drying clothes by putting a clothes, uh, clothes spin, and then um, you know, drops, accidentally drops one of them and pretends can't reach. And then a child about 14 months old, you know, immediately gets up, first watches, and then immediately gets up and picks it up and gives it back. There's another scene where uh, a grown-up is taking a stack of magazines and trying to put it in a cupboard and then bends down, but because his hand is full, can't open the door, a child comes and opens the door and understands. So they are, and it turns out they do this kind of helping behavior instinctively you know, without being asked. And in fact, when they were given rewards, it sounds, it, actually it turns out to be counterproductive because then in future they are less likely to do that. And it's an, it's an interesting, there's something here for the parents, you know, <laughs> to, to, to remember because I know in the West it's kind of quite normal for parents to, you know, ask children to do the chores and pay them. It's almost like a kind of a bribery, <laughs> in fact. And uh, so, you know, fortunately, my wife and I, you know, we right from the beginning, we said, no money for chores, you know. <laughs> they will get their weekly allowances, but it's not directly tied to anything that they have to do for the home. But the chores are chores they have to do. Uh, so it's, so those kind of work. And then uh, one very remarkable set of uh, research uh, was done with children very, very young age, you know, four, three to four months old. Now they're pre-verbal. They can't move, you know, uh, autonomously. So they're sitting. And then they are shown video images of cartoon characters. Um, you know, they're like kind of round and squares and, you know, triangles. But they are animated so that their eyes and mouth, so that children can recognize they're almost like kind of, you know, being, sentient beings. And there's a scene where there's one object that's trying to go up this hill and keeps falling back and tries to go up and another object comes behind and gives it a push, it helps it to get over. In another scene, um, the, 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 this object does the same thing, but now instead of someone helping from behind and pushing it up, another one comes from the top and knocks it down. <laughs> so there's a hindering behavior and children inevitably shows much greater preference for the helping behavior. Now these are children very, very, very young. The scientists have a way of tracking their eyes and one of the things is that they 
make them choose uh, which toy they want afterwards. Um, so, you know, that, and clearly, you know, these are very, very powerful impulses. You know, they, and so, as the Buddhists have argued, that these traits are inborn, innate. These are not learned behavior, and which now increasingly science is proving. So, so all of these are beginning to really uh, open up this big debate about, you know, how do we conceive ourselves, our species. So the human nature, and at least, I think the biologist and evolutionary scientist uh, are forced to rethink, you know, how can we now reimagine our conception of human nature so that there is a robust place for this other side of our character, the nurturing, the caring impulses. And in fact, you know, some economists have developed, you know, games, you know, they do economic games and models, computer simulations. And when the cooperative games, the only principle that is allowed put in is pure self-interest, the cooperation doesn't last very long. After a couple of rounds, when it's played by many people, the whole thing breaks down. Now, if they introduce another variable, which is an ultra, what they call altruistic punishment, which sounds almost like oxymoron, you know? <laughs> but the, the point here is that it give, you, when you give some players the opportunity to punish a cheater at some cost to himself, so this, is, this involves giving money. Then this person who is doing this is actually individually suffering a loss, but it is promoting the well-being of the group. So when you allow that possibility, then the cooperation becomes much more sustained over long periods of time. And so clearly, even to explain the evolution of large-scale human cooperation and society, it, it, it seems to be clear that pure pursuit of pure self-interest just doesn't work. So all of this, I think, is a really good uh, news. And, and, um, and of course, these, have, you know, these kind of changes are now coming together with um, um, also beginnings of kind of you know, uh, contemplative practices that are being brought from the Buddhist tradition to help us, you know, in some sense, exercise these natural muscles so that we can develop them and we can make them more, you know, active in our life. So I think all of this is really um, pointing to a time when I think people are, and also as a society and individually, we uh, are at a time, and I, um, I believe that you know, compassion is going to make a big way. You know, it, compassion is going to come in a big way into society. Because there is, first of all, there is the need. And then secondly, there is the science that is coming out. And thirdly, I think people are beginning to learn that, that qualities like compassion and so on and kindness, although have been promoted by religions, they are in themselves very basic, fundamental human qualities. And to be human is to be able to express those kind of parts of ourselves. I think those kind of things are beginning to figure in people's consciousness. And my book is primarily aimed at making those kind of points. Um, and one of the, and, and I see this larger compassion kind of revolution as part of this bigger movement that we see today uh, of mindfulness movement. You know, we see mindfulness in the healthcare, now increasingly in the education domain, uh, wealth, you know, well-being, and so on and so forth, now in management as well. So I think there is this, you know, a much larger public receptivity to these kind of ideas where and the beauty of these kind of ideas, like compassion and mindfulness, is that it actually empowers us as individuals, where we can do something about our own <coughs> mental processes. So, you know, mindfulness uh, movement and, and increasingly the compassion move, uh, practice movement um, does not leave when it comes to uh, empowerment of our own mental life to some 
group of experts in white coats. Because a lot of the discoveries that we make from neuroscience has to do with the brain. And the, you know, what you see in brain, uh, you know, the discoveries are fascinating. But in the end, that knowledge can only be used by an expert in a white coat you know, who has certain profession and who, is, who has the expertise to read the, whatever the brain scanner's result is and tell you what it is. Whereas when we look at it from the mindfulness and the compassion angle, then we are looking at it from the first person experience angle. And when we are able to do this, then we are able to empower the individual, himself or herself, where he or she learns to do something that by himself or herself. And that, I think, is also very beautiful because then we, we know, in the end, I think, I genuinely uh, um, believe this very important, you know, teaching that the Buddha gave that, um, you know, with our mind, we create our own world. Uh, and and, and in, in a sense, what Buddha is saying is that we may be all living in a very you know, similar physical environment, the same world, but each of us, because the way we see the world, the attitudes that we bring, the values that we bring into our life, each of us experiences the world differently. And, and that, I think, is a fundamental insight. And, and mindfulness movement and compassion movement really enables us to take that insight seriously so that we can choose to live in a particular way. Now, more specifically, if you think about compassion, the beauty of compassion compared to mindfulness is the compassion is very natural. Mindfulness takes a time. <laughs> you have to cultivate it. You know, we are not naturally mindful creatures. You know, we are not naturally, we don't have the natural capacity to be able to focus single-pointedly on a prolonged period of time. You know, we are distracted creatures, and there's a reason for this, because, you know, evolutionarily speaking, we have to constantly be on guard. So, so mindfulness is something that we have to cultivate, and of course you can get it, you know, over, if you practice, but compassion is very natural. You know, compassion is part of our natural instinct. And anyone who has been a parent will know from their gut experience what it feels like to love a child. You know, in that you know, moment of experience, your focus is completely the other. You know, and your energy is to completely be there and do what is required. And that, in a nutshell, is what compassion is. There is a total focus on the other's need and other's well-being. There is almost a sort of a, a total you know, being in sync with that energy and being able to respond without having to think consciously. And so we know what it feels like. And you know, all of us have friends that we love, we care. You know, we have people with intimate connections and relations. So we know what it feels like to be compassionate. And it's, 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 the, it's the expression of that nurturing, caring instinct. And most of us are even able to ex extend this to a total stranger when the total stranger in front of us is in extreme pain, screaming, lying down, and crouched and sort of cramped up. Most of us, it doesn't really matter who that person is in front of us you know, we are able to feel that, understand that situation. We really cut through all the categorizations of, you know, this color, that color, this ethnicity, that ethnicity, this religion, that religion, you know, this linguistic community member, that linguistic community member. When, in the, when confronted with the situation of an acute pain and suffering, most of us have this ability to just cut through all of this and connect with that person at this very fundamental level of human reality, which is the experience of pain. And in the Buddhist tradition, in fact, sentient being is defined as an organism that has the capacity to experience pain. So pain and suffering 
is a fundamental characteristic of who we are as sentient. And because it's so fundamental, when we perceive someone in front of us in such pain, you know, we immediately identify with that situation in front of us. That is compassion. This is what we have. So, but most of us in our day-to-day -day life don't tap into it enough. You know, we, um, we reserve it to a very small group of people on a day-to-day -day basis. You know, once in a while, through the cracks, it comes out when there is a, you know, a stranger who is in really bad pain. That's about it. You know, we leave our compassionate, in, you know, the capacity more at the level of a response that is triggered by some situation. And we, so it, we wait for the situation. And evolutionarily speaking, maybe that is the purpose. You know, it's part, there's a strong emotional component. But the point I'm trying to make here is that we can do something so that we actually tap into this part of our side and try to live our life more from that place. Because compassion has a very strong emotional component, and therefore, it is part of our motivation system. You know, when we act out of kindness to help the person in front of us who is screaming, you know, it is our compassion that motivates us. You know, when we hit someone out of anger because we feel unfairly treated, or we feel kind of, you know, um, you know kind of uh, triggered. It's the anger that is the motivation. There might be some other you know, underlying reason, but it's the immediate anger that motivates us. So emotions are very powerful motivating factors. And if we can somehow bring compassion as part of, the, you know, part of our motivation system, it really will change a lot. So now the question is, why don't we do this more? And here, you know, and my book is called A Fearless Heart. You know, the, the sad thing is we bring a lot of resistance into our expression of our natural compassion. Fear, pride comes in the way, but often fear. And that fear because, you know, many of us worry that if we are too compassionate, People will take us for being a weak. Uh, people will take advantage of us. Uh, they will think of us as pushover. So we bring these kind of fear that sort of pulls us back. Sometimes and, uh, parents also bring fear by worrying about if I'm kind to my child, if I'm too compassionate, then I might spoil my child. You know, my child must become too dependent on me. Uh, they need to build character and the strength. So we, then we pull back. Um, sometimes we also worry that, um, and this is particularly in the West, because in the West there's a long history of thinking about you know, emotions as, and reasons, rationality and emotion as somehow two conflicting parts of us, our psyche constantly at odds with each other. And we tend to relegate compassion to the emotion you know, kind of family, that people worry that if I allow myself to be too kind, and if I allow myself to express that more compassionate part of me, then maybe my rationality and my kind of reasoning part and critical thinking and toughness, that might, part might get sort of, you know, undermined. So, so, and then, you know, I may not be so successful in life. So we bring these kind of fear, and it's understandable, part, partly because the society that we are living in is a highly competitive society. Um, comp some element of comp competition I don't think is avoidable, uh, sorry, unavoidable, because in any society, uh, as, as human beings, so long as you are part of a community, some element of comparing ourselves with others and some element of competition I, I don't think it is avo avoidable. Um, and in fact, progress in a, in a society probably presupposes there is some element of competition. But the kind of competition that we are in, in, in contemporary society, is relentless. And we get into this, you know, some people even call it rat race. You know, and it is very apt description. 
we get into this from a very early stage, you know, when my children were going to school and from the grade one, which is age six, you know, every time there was an evaluation, it sort of pained me, actually, because, you know, I, I kept worrying about what is all this judgment, you know, evaluation and cross-comparison is doing to the soul of my kid, you know? <laughs> so we, you know, we bring up our children in this highly competitive, in a way, where they are constantly evaluated, constantly judged, and also parents subconsciously, you know, um, somehow give the message that when, when our children were successful in academic performance or, you know, music or some sports or whatever, you know, because we are so happy, we show our joy, it sort of plays a strange game where it reinforces the child's internalization of their worth contingent upon some kind of success. And that, I think, is very, very characteristic of contemporary society. You know, if you compare contemporary society's kind of sense of self-worth with someone coming from a traditional society, it's very different. I, you know, had the good fortune of growing up in a traditional Tibetan society, although it was a refugee community on the material front, of course, it was very, very basic. But on the emotional front, you know, even though I was taken away from my family life, put into boarding school, you know, I should come out damaged, actually, you know, at the age of four and a half, thrown into a boarding school. But I actually feel grateful that I had the chance to grow up in traditional Tibetan society where each children, each child, you know, somehow learns to develop an intrinsic sense of worth. Now, I'm now beginning to realize how precious gift that is. You know, I mean, it is, you know, your sense of worth of who you are is not contingent upon, you know, whether you get the top grade or whether you come first in a race or, you know, of course, when we come first, we are going to be elated because that's the competition. You gain the results, you win, you enjoy it. But somehow that doesn't seem to be connected to the sense of worth we learn to, you know, internalize as children. But in the West, in contemporary society, this is a huge challenge. And um, so they, um, you know, when I developed the Stanford Compassion Training, that was one area that I was actually, um, you know, found a huge challenge. You know, many, you know, the, the first kind of, you know, a, a prototype of the, the program was offered at Stanford undergraduates. And the initial program was modeled on the traditional Tibetan, uh, you know, development sequence. And we start with basic mindfulness and breathing and calming the mind and focusing kind of practices. And then we immediately move to self-compassion and then expand the circle to include a loved one, then a stranger, and then a difficult person, and then everybody. That was the traditional kind of sequence, but that did not work. You know, it was right, you know, many, most students just couldn't proceed beyond the self-compassion. They found it too challenging. And many people, many students even have almost instinctively aversive reaction to listening to phrases like, may I find peace, may I, may I be happy, you know, may I have joy in my life. They, they had almost like an aversive reaction, which so we had to completely change that sequence. Um, so I think part of that has to do with, you know, having to learn, having learned from a young age to somehow make our own sense of worth conditional upon some external, to some external criteria of success. And I think this highly competitive cultural environment um, really, I think, it, you know, this is my speculation, probably makes us internalize some kind of defense self-protection mechanism quite early in our life, you know, where we learn to be quite harsh on ourselves. You know, many people, um, particularly in the West, um, um, you know, coming from the Christian heritage, are very kind and compassionate, naturally, because one of the most important values 
uh, and messages coming from the New Testament is the, you know, the, 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 the message of mercy and the mes message of forgiveness and the message of compassion. That's very, very powerful in the Christian heritage. And it's not, it's, it's not an accident that many of the great um, charitable work uh, in the third world countries are done primarily by Christian um, missions. Uh, I don't think there's, it's, I don't think it's a, it's a coincidence. I think there is a reason because the charity and compassion has very, very deep roots in the Christian kind of, you know, teaching and the Christian con kind of consciousness. So a lot of people in the West, and particularly America, you know, if you look at the statistics and data of most charitable giving across the world, America comes on top. And, uh, you know, I think this is important to know, you know, because sometimes Americans, particularly more left-leaning type, you know, have a kind of a self-image, oh, we are such bullies in the world, you know, everybody hates us, we are, you know, we are kind of unmindful. But there's also a, a beautiful side of America. You know, America is the, you know, when it comes to personal charitable giving, America really comes way above uh, many other Western nations. Um, now, some of the members of the other nations might say, oh, well, because America doesn't tax enough and we pay so much tax. <laughs> and I'm sure there is a lot of arguments. You know, I, I brought this up to my, uh, with my father-in-law. Uh, you know, my wife is French-Canadian. Um, and it turned, on that study, actually, Quebec came pretty bad. Um, <laughs> so... <laughs> And I, at one of the dinner tables, the conversation, I said to my father-in-law, who's the doctor, I said, well, it's quite embarrassing to see this and know that you know, I'm a Quebecois. <laughs> and he said, no, Jimpa, you don't realize we pay so much tax, <laughs> and the Americans pay, don't pay not enough tax. Um, but whatever that may be the case, but many of these charitable giving in the States are done by ordinary people. So in the West in general, and particularly in America, people have this natural capacity to be kind and helpful. But where there is a challenge is the self-compassion. So I think that has more to do with the highly competitive nature of society. And in the long run, if you don't sort out this self-to-self -self relation, you know, having the ability to be more kind to yourself, having the ability to legitimately feel comfortable that your aspirations are legitimate, um, and, and if you have, a, at some fundamental level, a sense of alienation from yourself, even though you might be very charitable, you know, instinctively kind, that kind of kindness and compassionate behavior, it's very difficult to sustain over a long period of time. And, and so often what happens is that people who are outward looking, they help a lot of people, but when they are lacking something in their own self-to-self -self relationship, then at some point they feel exhausted, burned out, and also at some point they feel, you know, if things don't go the way they expect, and if the reception on the other part is, you know, not positive, then you feel betrayed, and then you might in fact end up having more bitterness in that kind of dynamic, dynamic of relationship. So in all of this, I think self-compassion really is, you know, crucial. So I think here, um, you know, again, uh, it's a question of, you know, uh, learning to be more aware, you know, how you behave with yourself. For example, when you confront with a disappointment, a failure, you know, just, you know, initially it's very difficult to catch yourself because to be able to catch yourself in the moment presupposes you have some ability to reflect. And, but that comes through training, that comes through you know, habituation. So initially, you may not be able to catch yourself, but then once the, the situation is already over, then it's helpful to reflect, how did I react to that situation? You know, did I wallow in self-pity and sort of cooped up? Or did I act out of, react with anger, saying that, you know, blame it on everybody else? That the whole world is, unkind, you know, unfair to me and all of that? Or is there a more constructive way of relating to this, where I can bring kindness and compassion? So if you do that, 
And it's, it's a way of reappraising the situation. And if you are able to do that, rehearse that more and more, gradually, you know, the gap between the actual experience where you react and where you are able to bring this more reflective approach will become narrower and narrower and narrower. And at one point, you will be able to recall. And this is, in fact, in the traditional Buddhist context, that was the role of mindfulness. Mindfulness, in the traditional context, has a connotation of recalling, remembering. And what do we remember? The precepts. This is coming, in the, of course, in the monastic tradition. Monks take precepts, and you familiarize with the precepts on a daily basis. So when you're confronted with a challenging situation which can you know, challenge your you know, commitment to the precepts, you recall the precepts that you have so that it acts as a restraint. So that's how mindfulness was supposed to work in the traditional Buddhist context. Of course, now we're using it in a completely <laughs> different <laughs> purpose. But similarly here, if we are able to bring more awareness. Now, initially, we, bring on, we are able to bring awareness only subsequently after the fact. But as you do more and more, then you will be able to bring it closer and closer to the actual react, reaction. And they will come a point where you, know, you will be able to step back. And it takes, you don't have to take a minute or two. It's only like a one moment of a breathing time. Simply taking the breath, you know, a longer breath, that changes everything. And, and that could save so much trouble down the line. <laughs> and it sounds very simple, but it has huge implications. And if you're able to not only restrain, but also bring a more proactive approach, where instead of you know, bringing your you know, um, normal pattern of negative reactivity, if you're able to bring proactive compassion, kindness, then not only are you able to restrain, but you're also able to you know, relearn the way you, re you know, respond to a situation. So this is, you know, and these are things that really uh, you know, are promises that mental practices like mindfulness and compassion really holds. In, in the end, the individual himself or herself stand to gain. And also, there is now a tremendous amount of research showing that, um, in fact, you know, even when it comes to personal happiness, compassion really is the key. Now, this sounds paradoxical, because when we think about compassion, we think about someone's suffering, someone's problem. And we have to make room in our heart for that person's problem. And we, should be, we will be taking more misery. And it should make us more miserable. But it turns out, actually, when we open our heart and able to respond to another person's problem with compassion, we ourselves gain. Now, there is, uh, you know, the scientists talk about help us high. And this is actually, they mean this euphoric sense. And uh, there's a chemical that, you know, a a gets activated when you feel kind of high and happy. And they have noticed that people who act out of kindness and help others they experience this surge of chemical in their brain, indicating that they're actually you know, enjoying this. Now, this seems weird. But on the other hand, if you think about it, it makes perfect sense. Because one of the things that happens when you are able to open your heart and connect with someone out of compassion, at that moment, you have, you have been able to forget yourself. And when we are able to forget ourselves, then we allow joy to come up. Because most of the time, it is our own self-consciousness that comes in the way of experiencing joy. Now, many of us will know that, for example, if we are going to a party where there's a lot of people that we don't know, the moment we are self-conscious, we become very uncomfortable. But if we are able to let go of that self-consciousness and be part of that energy, you enjoy it. So we know that, and so if you step back and think about all the happiest moments you have in your memory, I bet you the common denominator in all of these is the ability to forget yourself. Now that is interesting because, you know, it's almost like a paradox. In order to find personal joy, somehow we have to forget ourselves. 
And so, so that's, I think, very uh, another important thing about compassion that has been the scientists are beginning to discover is that compassion is probably one of the most effective buffer against the problem of loneliness. And loneliness is increasingly becoming a major issue in our time. Um, there was this very sad statistic uh, data that came out a couple of years ago that it says that uh, in the United States, one in five or one in four people say that they don't have someone that they can share you know, their thoughts um, and problems. And you know, many people, something like 25% of the population feel lonely at least once or twice a week. So loneliness is, is, a, is increasingly becoming a problem. But when you are able to allow your heart, you know, open it, and then feel compassion for someone, the, the key component of compassion is the ability to identify with someone, to connect with someone. So in that kind of experience, there is no room for loneliness. Because loneliness normally arises when you feel some degree of alienation at some level. You know, you don't, you don't feel somehow you belong. You know, you feel kind of slightly outside. And, and loneliness is one of those weird things where, you know, you have a view of yourself looked at from outside. You know, it's, it's, it's this kind of aloneness, almost like a kind of a, an entity on its own. And so when you feel compassion, in some sense, you are in sync with the other person. And, and we shouldn't confuse loneliness with being alone. You know, someone can be completely alone like a hermit, but feel totally connected with the universe. And this is one of the main idea behind the mystical experiences. But someone could be in the midst of a crowd in a very large family, but feel deeply, deeply lonely. So loneliness is actually a state of mind. And here, too, compassion is really a powerful factor. And finally, I think one of the most important gifts that compassion gives us is that it gives us a sense of purpose. When you feel compassion, you act out of your know, compassionate heart, kindly to help someone. At that moment, you feel useful. And there is nothing like feeling that you matter. You know, I mean, this is very important. I mean, that's why, you know, people who retire sometimes go through a very difficult time because they're used to being so important and they, you know, used to being matter, but then all of a sudden you are in a situation where you no longer matter that much and it's, you know, it freaks you out. So, but compassion offers us, each of us, the opportunity to really make our life meaningful and purposeful. And, and it turns out that having a sense of purpose is one of the most important you know, factors for happiness. And also, um, it is associated with longevity. Um, so, in, so, so compassion has all of these wonderful qualities. But also, compassion arises when we are able to identify with someone. And here, it turns out that it's not that difficult to identify with someone. You know, maybe when you think of you know, two opposing tribes and the opposite members of the one tribe, sometimes they're very difficult to see the members of the other tribe as fellow human beings so because there is us versus them and this tribalism is very strong in us. Um, and sometimes in order to feel very strongly for your own community, it involves you know, making this distinction. But on the other hand, it turns out that being able to identify with someone isn't that difficult. There is this amazing study that was done, experiment, um, where you know, participants were brought in, and they were uh, sitting in front of two computers, monitors. You know, they could see each other. And they have to put on a headphone and listen to a music. And in one group, they were listening to the same music at the same speed. And they were asked to tap their fingers to the rhythm. So they were tapping the fingers to the rhythm, listening to the music. But in one group, because they were listening to the same music at the same time, 
they were tapping in synchrony. In another group, they were listening to different musics, so they were tapping their fingers, but they were tapping in, not in synchrony. Now that was the experiment. And then after that, they were given an opportunity where one of the partners could see his or her partner being unfairly penalized for doing something which they haven't done. And, and then how does this partner react? And they were also asked to rate how much they liked the other person, you know, and so on. There are many questions asked. Amazingly, those members who were in the group where they tapped in the synchrony, you know, they were much more likely to empathize this unfair treatment. And they also rated liking the other person much more. I mean, that was the only difference. It's just that, you know, tapping in synchrony. So we, and, and if you ask these individuals, they probably wouldn't be conscious that they were, this was what was making them feel more, you know, you know, inclined to like the other person. But simply because they did something together, you know, that, that, that commonality and perception of that commonality really may change the way they felt about this other person. And this, I think, is, is, is a, you know, it's, it seems like a kind of, you know, a slightly trivial discovery, but I think it's a very important discovery for understanding how compassion works. If, if compassion requires an ability to identify with someone, and then if a simple identification with someone can lead to liking that person and being more disposed to help, then clearly it suggests the possibility that we can learn to develop compassion for anybody. You know, because we can think about, at least at the fundamental level, all of us want to be happy, none of us want to suffer. That is a fundamental reality. And this is why the Buddhist derived meditation, where we use this mantra, just like me, he wants to be happy. Just like me, she doesn't want a problem. It's proving to be so powerful. It's a very simple exercise, but the fact that we are willing to allow ourselves to see the commonality with this other person, who may be completely different ethnic, ethnic background, you know, we learn to identify. You know, and then once we're able to identify with this other person, then it opens up the whole possibility of responding with compassion. So here, I think our perception and our attitude, you know, our perception shapes our attitudes, and our attitudes shapes our emotional you know, responses, and our emotions shapes our behavior. So there is, at least in theory, the basis for a real transformation here, where we can change the way we think about others, and we change the way we feel about others, and then we change the way we behave in relation to the others. That, in a nutshell, is the message of compassion training. Now, I have really kind of gone here and there and you know, brought a lot of things together, but those who are you know, more interested in delving deeper into you know, what does compassion and cultivation training involve, um, there are, it turns out, actually quite a number of uh, uh, instructors here in this area. I, I met a lot of them in the Northwest area. In, uh, this is also a part of Northwest, isn't it? Yeah, so I was in Portland, and uh, you know, I met with a group of them there. And there were, there, I think there are also some locally here in the Seattle area who have been trained in the Stanford Compassion Training. I know one is here, Donna. Uh, um, and then, yeah, so who else is here? Oh, can you all stand up so that... Um, Oh, so there's quite a lot, okay? So, um, so you know, and, and the, the, all the information are on the Stanford Compassion Center's website. Uh, Stanford Compassion Center is C-Care, but if you don't remember that, just Google Stanford Compassion on Compassion and Stanford, then the, the C-Care website will pop up. And C-Care website has a whole section on compassion cultivation training that I helped to develop, and these instructors are really trained to be able to deliver this eight-week course, which is a much more comprehensive, integrated uh, training. Uh, and I think in the end, um, you know, I mean, His Holiness always says that 
people often think that compassion is good for others, but not necessarily good for yourself. <laughs> but he says, the actual fact is, the first beneficiary of your experience of compassion is yourself. Now, whether or not your compassion leads to real benefit to others depends on many other factors. But when you experience compassion, that is real for you. And you are the first beneficiary. I think that is a very, very profound you know, advice. Um, so we're going to have question and answers. But let me read um, just very, very short uh, passage from my book. Um, because this, this, this uh, talk is, a, is part of a, a, a larger kind of book tour I'm doing to promote my book. Because um, and this is, in fact, the first time I've written a book like this for general readership. Um, and uh, I've had the privilege to serve His Holiness and assist him on many of his books. But, uh, and then I've written my own books, but those tend to be very specialized. But this is really the first uh, time that... Um, so let me just read a very, very short passage from here. Um, when we look, we can always find opportunities to express our compassionate side through kindness in our everyday life. The question is not whether I'm compassionate. Rather, the question is, will I make the choice to express the more compassionate part of me? Whether we live our lives with compassion, whether we relate to ourselves, others, and the world around us from a place of compassion, understanding, and kindness is up to us. To me, this is also the most important spiritual question of human existence. Thank you. So there are microphones over there on the two sides. So please uh, feel free to ask questions. Yeah, you can shout, yeah. You said you were not successful with the Stanford students because it was very hard for them to start with self-compassion. Yes. So that's a problem in the West. How did you, did you reshape the course? Yes, yes. And did it work? Yes, it work. Uh, definitely, yeah. Well, what we did was we, we uh, changed the sequence so after having learned the basic skills of quieting the mind and learning to focus and developing uh, some meta-awareness to observe what's going on in your mind and so on, then instead of going to self-compassion, we went straight to compassion and loving kindness for a loved one. And then, because that's something that we normally naturally feel, and we use that as a way of learning to recognize what it feels like, you know, at our heart or in our gut or whatever it is. And then, you know, gently make the point that if we can do this to others, we can also do this to ourselves. So then the self-compassion becomes a matter of turning that, you know, kind of impulse of kindness and understanding to our own situation. So then it worked. Yeah. Thank you. Yes? Uh, good evening and thank you for coming. Thank you. So, um, can you speak about the difference between pity and compassion? Um, yes, thank you for that question. Um, the way I understand it is that pity involves some element of looking down, feeling sorry, and there is an assumed sense of superiority of yourself. Whereas compassion is in some sense more egalitarian where you recognize the sameness of the fundamental condition that just like me, this person too wishes to be happy and do not want suffering. So there's a, uh, there isn't that looking down. Um, there isn't that sense of superiority on your part. So that's the difference. But maybe that's the difference that we are now bringing in. But initially, whether pity has this element of looking down, we don't know. Thank you. Follow up is um, even with with having said that, um, how does a how does a person, in within themselves, 
start differentiating the difference because just thinking about, you know, some of the things that I've seen or maybe even experienced, um, people may come from a place of they think is compassion, but it's actually self-pity. Sure. And then they have that, um, what I call flavor of the month. Yes. Like, this is the cause that we're going to, to help, but the people are going to help this month and then this year. So you kind of get this whole sort of wavering kind of thing. Sure. So. I think in, in the personal experience, um, you know, I have, uh, like I'm sure most of us here, you know, I've experienced a pity myself. Um, but I think if you look at it from one's own personal experience, when you experience self-pity as opposed to self-compassion, I think in that moment there's a kind of a, a narrowness and also there's a kind of a sense of being down, you know, kind of oppressed. Um, so self-pity, first of all, the focus becomes very narrow. And, you know, in experience of self-pity, there's no room for others. Uh, and also there's a feeling of being really down, you know, kind of, you know, you, you feel weighed down. Whereas when you feel genuine self-compassion, you know, there isn't that feeling of being oppressed and you know, put down, and also there is a room for others. Because in self-compassion, we are recognizing that we are just like someone else. But we care for our own pain and our own situation. So qualitatively, they feel completely different. You know, they may seem like similar. So if that, I mean, does that explain? Okay, okay. Yes. Yes. Sure, sure. But here, I think the main thing is that when you have pity, there's a slight sense of superiority. That, that's the, probably the difference, yeah. Thank you. Yes? So if we're the uh, first beneficiary of compassion, are we not led back to the idea that we only do things in our self-interest? <laughs> good question. That's a very good question, um, and, and thank you for bringing this back. Um, now, I think here uh, we need to make a distinction between what is the actual motivation and what is a byproduct. I think when we act out of genuine compassion, uh, you know, as the science says, and then also the Buddhist tradition agrees that the person himself or herself experiences a sense of expansiveness um, and and you know, in some degrees, kind of joy as well. But that is a byproduct. That is not the reason why the person did the act. So I think here, um, you know, I remember having, you know, uh, many years ago at Stanford Compassion Center, the first conference we put on was about agreeing or not agreeing, but trying to come to terms with the consensus on general definitions of the key terms like compassion, altruism, kindness, empathy, you know, all of these uh, key terms and constructs. And I remember having arguments with some of the, you know, evolutionary theorists as well as economists who were there, you know, trying to make this distinction. You know, when we talk about motivation and intention of a person of a particular act, in most cases we are talking about the person, the reason why he does it is the motivation. Intention is the conscious intent of the person. Now, in genuine compassionate act, neither in the conscious intent nor in the underlying motivation, there is anything to do with the self. The ultimate goal of that person is the well-being of this person in front of you. Now, if it leads to greater joy and sense of purpose, that is a byproduct. So I don't think we should conflate the two. And in the past, these two have been conflated. Thank you. So in a sense, my, you know, I said that in my book, that my Cambridge you know, fellow students were right. There was something in it for Mother Teresa. <laughs> but that was not the reason why she was doing it. Yeah. Yes? Um, you talked a bunch about compassion kind of as a value gaining ground globally and how it's sort of becoming more of an accepted thing in Western culture. And I was wondering, um, 
what do you see as the next steps really in terms of how it could gain more ground and how this kind of, it would be like a tipping point to have it be a more accepted value in such a um, me, me, me culture kind yes. of thing? Thank you, uh, thank you for that question. Um, I think, you know, it, it sounds kind of, um, um, well, not paradoxical. Uh, yeah, it is kind of paradoxical. I think probably just as mindfulness started to be accepted widely when people became aware of the beneficial effects of mindfulness, which is a sort of a self-interest motivation, Similarly, I think they will be, you know, as science of compassion shows that compassion is actually really good for you, and then, you know, it leads to all these benefits and so on, I think there will be a greater propensity on the part of many people to think about it and, you know, um, I think that probably, I mean, that's kind of paradox. You know, we need the self-interest angle um, to somehow promote, which is, you know, essentially in other regarding, <laughs> you know, state of mind. Um, I think that, I think, will be one important, you know, part. Um, thank you. Um, I'd like to know, with the situation that we have going on in this country right now, very much in the press, between police force and citizens, I would like to know if you're aware of any police force either here in the U.S. or elsewhere that has actually used compassion training to try and uh, promote um, a better approach to policing? Thank you for that question. But, um, I mean, it is, you know, I have, I'm a Canadian, um, so I live on the other side of the, the border, um, the northern side of the border. <laughs> you know, this reminds me of something... Um, Many years ago, I was having a dinner at an American friend's place, and she has <coughs> a small child. So there was a, a sort of a, um, one of those maps where you have the important landmarks in three-dimensional images. Um, and uh, so there was a beautiful map. And then there was, on the top, it was just an icy sheet. <laughs> and it was written Canada. Uh, <laughs> Um, you know, I have sort of, you know, of course, um, uh, been following the news and uh, what has happened in Ferguson, Missouri, and um, now with Baltimore. Uh, it's very, very uh, painful to watch the news unfold and, uh, you know, very understandable, but also quite unacceptable the level of violence in the part of the response. Um, to the police and all of this. Um, and, but I don't know of any program that actually aims to bring this. Um, I think at some point, something like you know, compassion you know, training, not necessarily the CCT Stanford version, which is um, you know, quite, you know, quite integ you know, kind of intensive, but some kind of sensitization of you know, how a particular sector of the American society views, you know, police and figures of authority of that nature representing the law. Um, I think that, I think, is a very basic training that needs to be done. Um, you know, there needs to be some greater awareness and sensitivity on the part of people in the position of power and representing the law and, you know, how other people, those who are somehow, for whatever reason, feeling discriminated against and marginalized, perceive and see these figures. I think that, I think, is going to be very important. And, um, and I, I just hope that this tragic experience of Ferguson and Baltimore uh, will lead to a kind of a soul searching and also um, some kind of a rethinking of how, you know, what is the most skillful way of policing. Because in the, in, in the end, the bottom line is a peaceful, secure city and a peaceful, secure community. And if you can get it that, you know, if you can achieve that objective by being um, less 
assertive and aggressive in policing, all the better. Um, so, you know, I was actually horrified when I saw the scenes where the, 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 the American policemen were all geared up in military, you know, um, you know, almost like Marines, like, you know, um, that was pretty scary scene. Um, so I, I just hope that this will lead to a much larger cultural conversation um, and, you know, kind of soul searching and thinking. Thank you. Do you, do you mind, sorry, I just wanted to add to that because I actually have a response um, to that gentleman's question. So there is a program um, and it was developed by a gentleman, it was developed by a number of people through a collaboration between Hillsborough Police Department in Oregon actually and psychologists at Pacific University and a number of yoga teachers. It actually started in like 2007 and then it was, it was implemented and then was they're doing some dissemination right now. Um, oh, it, wonderful. But it, around like 2013 and actually like Police departments have a big investment in doing this kind of work because it was actually developed in response to like incredibly high numbers of first responder and particularly police department, um, like high rates of <laughs> suicide and mental health problems and substance use and um, intimate partner violence. And so they developed this program in response to those things directly for people that, that are police officers. But then like we can see that there are pretty direct connections between um, like aggression and impulse control and all of those things that are implicated in Baltimore and any number of police incidents that we know about over the past year in particular that have been going on. So anyways, it's it, you can, the person, um, if anybody's interested, Richard Gerling is the police, he's not the chief, but he's some important person in Hillsboro. And actually Toronto um, has, City of Toronto and yeah. suburbs has taken it up as something that they want to implement with their police departments. There was an article in Mindful Magazine, which is people can probably look up there. Oh, but thank you. It's called like <laughs> mindfulness based resilience training, maybe, or um, I think that's what it is. But yeah. anyway, they just. I hope thank that you. Was added in thank that. you for sharing that. Thank you. So we're going to have to end now. It's. Uh, uh, but we wanted to save a little time for uh, the book signing. Um, okay. So they're going to, uh, the U Bookstore is going to come in here and um, Geshe Jinpa will sign copies of his book here if you'd like to purchase a copy. Also, please don't forget about the uh, UW Nepalese uh, Student Association. They're out in the lobby um, and you can support the relief efforts in Nepal. And I'd uh, just like to uh, dedicate the merit of uh, this evening's talk to uh, the healing of all. Sentient beings, may all beings be happy. Thank you. Thank you.